is on, uh, that brings us to quorum at this point so we can get started. Uh, I've started the recording and Chris, with that, I'll kick it over to you. Okay, thanks Todd. So uh, just a sort of agenda review, we have uh, a readout from the, the Hackathon and the Hackfest and I'll invite anybody who is present to, to weigh in on either of those after I give my sort of two cents and Todd, I'd, I'd love to hear you know your perspective as well. You were there for both. And our no, and then um, uh, we've got the the hyperledger release taxonomy. Um, I I tweaked it a little bit. I think you know it's basically done. I th I know I was going to talk. You know I was going to do some thinking about sort of for you know periodic snapshot releases, but um, I I think we should just sort of put this to bed. And if we get to the point where we're starting to roll on on wanting to do those kinds of things, we can talk about what they look like and how they work. Um, and, and update it. So I'd like to just sort of put that behind us um, and take a quick vote. Um, uh, the wiki, um, I guess, Todd, are you going to update us on that? Yeah, we, know? Can, we can have a quick chat there. Okay. And then um, uh, Brian's not around, so I don't know if you want to talk any more length about discus and... Um, yep, we can. And so forth. Then we've got a proposal from... Um, um, uh, uh, Takiyama san and he's going to go through the Aroha project. He did this for us at the Hackfest, and that was um, it was an interesting um, proposal. And so he's going to present it here, and then we can um, uh, have a discussion about um, bringing it in as an incubator. Um, uh, Satish is going to give us a demo of the Java chain code um, that is now sort of ready for prime time. Um, and then we'll have work group updates. And um, in, in addition to the work group updates, I just wanted to, Todd, you, you didn't list them out, but um, uh, there's actually been a request, and I, I don't see a reason why we wouldn't just go ahead and do this. Um, the folks that are working on um, sort of the, the Fabric SDK projects, the Java um, node and, and Python uh, have been collaborating on a, on a document, and, and they've asked, can they have a work group? And so I think so. <laughs> and uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when we get down to the work group update. So unless there's any other uh, topics, I think we can get going. So Chris, before you go, I, I have one other topic, and uh, it's okay if we don't get to it today. It's not urgent, but I just wanted to bring it up to everybody's attention. There was a comment made, actually, on the Code of Conduct uh, it's being looked at by other projects in, in the Linux Foundation and mm -hmm. so to be reused and uh, there's an issue with the way we have defined the inc incident procedure so I would like to discuss this briefly if we okay, have time. Okay, if we have time, yeah, we'll put that and then certainly we can add it to the to next week's if, yeah. if we don't have time. that will be fine too. Thanks. Okay. So very quickly then, uh, any any other any other? Um... Okay. Um... Yeah. Chris, it's very good. Yep. I had proposed, uh, and I actually also sent you and Brian this. Oh, the hip uh, numbering scheme. Okay, yes. Let's um, let's add that, Todd. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? If not, um, let's start with the Hackfest and Hackathon readout. So um, this past weekend in Amsterdam, we had um, two events. One was a, a true hackathon, you know, with prizes and competing teams and a race, you know, over 36 hours to produce running code built on one of the Hyperledger projects. Um, and uh, I, 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 and then the other was, of course, the Hackfest, which is our sort of every other month get together, and um, uh, you know, combination of you know help new people on board as well as you know go through some of the um, uh, some of the architectural issues and and have you know deeper and and uh, you know better conversations than we're able to achieve on Slack and so forth. And I think that was. Uh, that was also good. So that, let's start with the hackathon. So, and I apologize for the background noise. 
front. Can people hear me? Hopefully the background noise isn't too yes. bad. I'm yep. Having the, the final touches put on my new windows. <laughs> it's a little noisy. Um, and just in the nick of time, too. Uh, so, so we had, from the hackathon perspective, there were, um, I believe, 20 teams um, in total. I think there were 24 teams that registered and we ended up having to, a couple where people either didn't make it and so didn't have a full team and so we had some combinations. Um, and uh, so we had a total of 20 teams uh, and I think it was 120 some odd individuals um, uh, collaborating together. So there were teams of five or six um, and, uh, and then we had uh, what Todd about uh, probably a dozen or so genius people. <laughs> yep. People, you know, the genius bar, right, of, you know, people who are familiar with the technology and could answer basic questions, whether on, uh, uh, you know, the fabric or Sawtooth Lake and, and um, uh, or, you know, Linux and just how to get set up and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and then we had, uh, obviously, judges, and so Brian and myself and, uh, John Klippinger from MIT, uh, and, uh, and then we had some executives from AB and AMRO, um, uh, all sort of, you know, peering over the shoulders of the teams as they were going through and getting periodic updates and so forth. Um, and it was really quite an event. So 36 hours, people slept, you know, <laughs> under the tables um, uh, overnight, uh, some of them, uh, and uh, it was really, it was really quite an event. Uh, I was really, really pleased with, you know, just the turnout. I, I certainly didn't expect, you know, that many people, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, it was a very well attended event. The teams were really excited. Um, you know, there was teams from AB and AMRO, from Accenture, uh, a, a few startups uh, had. Uh, you know, brought teams together, and then, like I said, there were some teams that were comprised of, uh, you know, smaller um, sub-teams, if you will, uh, or cannibalized teams um, uh, from startups as well as from larger companies. Um, and uh, there were some IBM teams. And so it was, a, it was I, you know, personally, I, I, I got a lot out of it. Uh, I learned a lot. I learned about you know the fact that you know there's people that actually understand the technology, how to use it, and and we're you know sort of really doing I think a very effective job of uh, you know applying the technology to solution in, in, in solution of a problem. Um, we had applications ranging from uh, there was a voting uh, you know a mobile app that you know you could use to do voting and delegation of your vote. Uh, that utilized a blockchain on the back back end to trace both the the results of the and and the balloting uh, you know and, and and you know making sure that they couldn't be changed as well as tracking who actually had the you know had the voting chit if you will if they were uh, delegating a vote um, I thought that was really kind of cool that was my personal favorite um, there was a healthcare um, application sort of putting together a um, uh, if you will a um, a bank, you know, account for your healthcare information. So this is sort of taking the EHR concept, the electronic health record, but putting it on the blockchain and, and putting you in control of the information as opposed to, you know, having it up in somebody's cloud. Um, I thought that was, and that actually won, that was the, the number one uh, prize winner. And that was actually a very, very good application. I think, you know, there are some privacy things and confidentiality that still have to be solved, but it was it was actually pretty good. There was a uh, insurance for um, uh, for 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 when your flight is delayed. Apparently, in Europe, there's a law that says that the airline companies have to pay if they're um, if they're late, and there's like a fifty dollar fine that, that goes to the to the traveler. But you have to get an insurance policy, and so they actually sort of disintermediated the whole process, and they just put it all on the blockchain. And, and so the airlines would sort of pay up immediately. So if your flight was delayed, you got 50 bucks credit on your on your cell phone. Kind of a neat uh, application. There was a 
uh, you know, then there were some typical fintech kind of applications of um, currency transfer. Uh, there was a Swift-like um, uh, application of uh, doing funds transfers, uh, you know, around the globe um, between banks. There was um, uh, another one that uh, sort of was like a PayPal, if you will, where um, you know you, you go to the vendor and and you you buy something and and then you basically do a transfer of funds between the banks. It shows up directly in the um, in the in the provider's uh, bank account. It was kind of neat. I mean, so there's a number of different applications, um, all of them interesting, and, and and each of them sort of took you know at parts of the the total solution and uh, you know really understood how it all fit together, how the chain code worked, and how the uh, role-based access control stuff worked, and so forth, and the events. It was really really pretty compelling, uh, not just you know simple hello world kind of things. Um, and um, uh, you know, then there was prizes. There was a, a steel drum bands. <laughs> there was you know, free free food and beer and, and coffee, <laughs> plenty of coffee to keep people awake. It was. I, I thought it was a really fantastic event. I was really energized by it. You know, because people got you know the software was working. I was like, yay! <laughs> there was a couple little hiccups early on, but we got past that, and, and people were, were up and running and. You know, some of people were using cloud. Some people were, you know, running it locally. Uh, depended on, you know, sort of what what type of aspect of their, their project they were working on. But it was for me. I don't know. I got a lot out of it. I don't know, Todd, I don't know um, what you guys thought of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, you know, it was a really great uh, experience going from Cybos the week before, which had so much business focus, so much focus in the. Uh, mm. finance sector uh, going into a weekend hackathon where it was very grassroots, community driven uh, with people writing a wide range of applications on top of Hyperledger. So exciting to see the e ecosystem developing there and then moving into the more uh, traditional hack fest with our you know, core developers. So it was a nice, well-rounded two weeks uh, and very interesting to connect with different segments of our ecosystem and community and really seeing that mm. continue to thrive. Yep. Arno? Yeah, I don't have really much to add. I thought that the ACFest was interesting. I was also surprised by the turnout. I only attended the part of the second day, but I saw kind of the outcome and, and did some networking with the people. I was yeah. also impressed by the uh, amount of excitement that the participants uh, exhibited. And they did have stories of sleeping in uh, on a bean bag for a couple of hours uh, mm -hmm. over the last uh, two days, which really showed the level of commitment they also had. So yeah. I thought it was great, and it was also we saw some of them come to the to our meeting afterwards, which That's I right. thought was also a good way to get more people into the Hyperledger project community. Yeah, and one one thing I took away from the hackathon. Uh, Todd and I've been sort of chatting behind the scenes with the, the guy that actually put it together. But um, you know, we have the starter kit and the fabric, and and uh, you know, I know Dan and 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 Mick, you guys have you know sort of a similar kind of a thing. But I thought it'd be useful if we could sort of take the idea of sort of a hack hackathon in a you know in a box kind of a thing where we could uh, you know have an up to date and collaborative. Uh, environment that got people up and running quickly that you know install all the right software provided them with uh, you know enough of a sample that you know you could you know more than a low world kind of a thing um, at, to sort of really sort of kickstart you know people uh, in developing their solutions and if we could have something like that that we manage then Greg and team you know can sort of trace the and track the various hackathons that people want to pull together, and and we can provide them with a you know a kit. And this doesn't have to be hyperledger hackathon; it could be just a blockchain one where we, you know, encourage you know people to start playing with the hyperledger, um, you know, whether it's Fabric or Sawtooth Flake or anything else. And 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 we're sort of making it as easy as possible for people to get up and running, um, and, and to be to be able to develop software. I don't know what people think of that, but I, I I'd be you know, if I can if I can get Tim to sort of contribute his stuff, that's a good start. We have the starter kit and fabric, and like I said, I 
I know that Mick and, and Dan have something for Sawtooth as well, so maybe we could take those things and just sort of formalize a, a little bit of a hackathon package that people can use. I'm not hearing disagreement, and I'm not hearing oh. anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Chris, I think I was muted. Um, sounds like a good idea. I think the other thing I was going to suggest that's, that's along those lines is, you know, we've talked about having, you know, like a public test network up um, in several cases as well. well. It might be nice to have a place where we could showcase um, the best of those applications uh, that yeah. we find as well. That's actually a, a cool idea. So one other thing I would add, I mean, the fact that the event was in Europe was interesting. I mean, it did force a lot of people to, to travel, but uh, it really showed to me at least, and I think to everybody really, that uh, there is a vibrant community of people interested in this in Europe as well as other parts of the world. And it shows that it is definitely worthwhile having this kind of events elsewhere than in North America. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, and then of course we have the Hackfest, um, you know, Monday and Tuesday, and yesterday was a travel day for a lot of people, um, and uh, I, I thought, you know, again, it was, uh, it was, it was, so, so it was two two good things I think came out of it. There were some of the same uh, people, but because it was in Europe, there was also uh, some missing um, uh, participants, but we had new participants, so we still had about sixty people, I think, right, Todd. Uh, certainly more than 50. Yep, yep, 60. All the tables were pretty much full. and um, um, But we had a lot of new blood, which was interesting. You know, we had people from Swift and Accenture and um, uh, CLS and um, and a few others. Uh, Santander uh, was represented there. So there's a number of, you know, sort of new, new faces. And, uh, you know, people were, you know, sort of a combination of sort of getting up and running and, and um, and and using the software, but also wanting to to get involved in collaborating and, and helping to build it. And so, um, and plus we, you know, Dan and Nick, we had some, you know, some new sawtooth people from from Europe. That was that was that was that was nice. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think you know to Arno's point, I think it was actually a very valuable thing. And you know, maybe I know Brian is interested in having uh, a hack fest in. In China, and we probably would have a hackathon as well to sort of to, to make it, um, you know, if we especially if we can get people to sort of go from one to the next um, the way that, that that they did in in Europe, I think that would be a positive thing. And and it, you know, I really strongly encourage uh, those of you who couldn't make it, you know, because of you know travel considerations and so forth. Maybe we'll try and provide a little bit more, you know, of a uh, runtime, although we did have like two, three months for this, but um, I would strongly encourage people to try and make an effort to, you know, whether we go to, I mean, China, I know it's a long way, 13 hours for me, and, you know, maybe even more for some, so, um, but I, I do think that, you know, it would be a very valuable experience uh, generally, and um, so, again, I, I know Brian, next time, you know, we get together, Next week, I think he wants to talk about some of that. Um, we are, Todd, uh, in terms of you know, sort of ongoing planning. I think we're starting to think about something for New York. Where where does that stand? Yeah, so uh, Brian kicked off a thread for that uh, a day or two ago. Um, one of the thoughts was that there's going to be a member uh, face to face December seventh and eighth in New York. Uh, so the thought was potentially doing a hack fest uh, the Monday Tuesday before that, which would be uh, December fifth and sixth. Uh, likely in New York, just if folks are traveling traveling in for that, and just you know, given the concentration of uh, member companies and technical community uh, in that general area, um, so you know, I know a few people responded on that thread with a, a variety mm -hmm. of feedback, but definitely interested from those on this call. Um, is that something that would be valuable for people to do in December? Does New York seem to be a good location, uh, or is that challenging with travel budgets toward the end of the year, uh, whatnot? But you know, interested in the feedback from those on this call. 
So Richard here. So um, I think I also saw a suggestion of I think I think Raleigh or somewhere in North Carolina or of the two, um, New York would be um, much better for us. Um, and and just a little bit of feedback on on, on Amsterdam. Um, James Carlyle, our chief engineer, was there on Monday and Tuesday, um, and, and I thought it was a, a fantastic event. Uh, we, we actually presented to our uh, or our three architectural working group on on our um, on James's trip report. Uh, you know, really collaborative, um, but not you know, but not. Overly differential. There were some really hard-hitting architectural discussions there, and um, and, um, and good technical debate. And he, he came back um, very, very energized. So, um, so, so, good job. Cool. Great. Good to hear. This is Jeremy Severide. Uh, there is an IBM-sponsored hackathon for blockchain uh, from their Plumix team this weekend in New York. That's right. Uh, yeah. That I and others will be participating in, but. Uh, um, it, I would imagine it's probably safe to assume that people can't always travel, and so just right. assume that they have to have something, and if they continue to be important, just have them in different places on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been trying to move them around, and like I said, I know Brian's going to want to talk next week about the potential for having a, a hack fest and potentially a, a hackathon, um, you know, sort of back to back the way we did in Amsterdam um, in China. Um, and so uh, we'll have a discussion around that. Uh, I think the New York thing, again, we have the members meeting. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but basically, um, you know, we've put out a call to all of the members of the Hyper Hyperledger uh, project, um, you know, all the sponsoring members, some of them paid, some of them not. Um, and so there's, I think, Todd, is it still two or is it three or? Uh, yeah, you know? we'll, we'll, two per company will be joining. Right. So it's two per company. I think it's intended to be much more of a, a business thing, but I thought, you know, some of us are, are going to have to do double duty. I know there's a board meeting, for instance, um, and so Dan and I will, will be involved in the board meeting, but um, um, uh, then, you know, if we could have sort of another back-to-back -back kind of a thing where we had a hack fest or, you know, just a face-to-face a -face meeting of the, the technical community, um, uh, and then followed by the, the the members meeting itself, that there's an opportunity to sort of commingle and maybe have a you know an evening event you know between them that kind of a thing, um, and and get a little bit of socialization. But I, I think that would be a, a good th certainly from my perspective. I'm keen on 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 doing it because I think we'll you know we won't have one in no in November, and so it'll be a good you know two plus month stretch between now and then. And uh, I think it'd be worthwhile to sort of get everybody caught up again and and uh, and sort of back on track before the holidays. So, for, from my perspective, I think it's a great idea. Cool. Just quickly before we move on, because I know we've got a lot of other things. Um, Dan, yeah. Mick, would that work for Intel Sawtooth Lake team? Uh, and Greg, uh, for you, how does travel look for that? Dan. The, uh, is Dan with the the members meeting and the board meeting. Um, on the one hand, it would be convenient for me to since I'll already be out in New York. On the other hand, that's um, probably consuming the entirety of the the week on <laughs> on meetings activities. So <laughs> fair enough. True. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm kind of inclined against it, but um, I don't really have strong feelings either way. Okay. Um, and on my side, I can I can probably make the travel. For at least a portion of the week. All right, Greg Hart. Um, I don't know. We've heard from either of you, but interested in your feedback for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have any. Or sorry, Greg, go ahead. You, you go ahead, Hart. Sorry. No worries. Um, I don't think I have anything that week. So yeah, I'd be happy to uh, to make it out there and and work with everybody. I assume that the proposed date's still the December 5th or 6th or whatever it was in the email. If so, I think I could make that. Okay. Um, we'll have a look. Um, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, if other people have feedback, uh, shoot a note on the email thread. Uh, we'll have a look at space and whatnot and come back bef to this group before we move forward with anything uh, just to, to check uh, next week as well. Yeah. It, and, and again, closing the date early makes life much easier. Yep. Yep. Yeah, fair yeah, enough. I agree, and I think you know we. I think as you know, we we should also try and make uh, part of that uh, be a TSC meeting, since the TSC will be sort of overlapping with the member meeting, and so some of us 
we won't be able to do both. So um, uh, I think we'd probably move the TSC meeting itself to, to one of those two days. Um, and I think it would be good to get together for that. So that's, that's another, another good reason. Um, OK. Um, so let's, let's sort of move on. So very quickly, I think, you know, so we had this uh, taxonomy proposal. We were up to version 3. I just tweaked it to make it version 4. Um, I think we had sort of, uh, in, in doing the release for the Hyperledger Fabric 06, we concluded that dash developer, dash preview was way too many things to type. Um, <laughs> so we, we abbreviated that to preview. But aside from that, you know, one of the things that I had sort of taken a, uh, to do was to sort of think about and integrate some thoughts on how to perform a snapshot release. Um, uh, and so, but I'm going to leave that out for now because I'd just like to get this finalized and off the action item review until we get to the point where we're actually mature enough where we can produce one of those uh, and then we can think about what it actually entails and so forth. Um, uh, we do have in there the snapshot for, you know, when you build it locally and, and uh, having, having that, you know, with the appropriate shop appended. And, and so forth, so you can, you know, so you know exactly, you know, from whence the software was derived. Um, so I think we have it pretty much done. I, like I said, I didn't really change anything except for the, the, uh, the, the suffix developer preview. And so I'd like to sort of put it to a vote um, to see if we can just sort of approve this and have it into the wiki, which we'll talk about in a second uh, once that's once that's up formally. So Todd, you want to, and again, people, maybe uh, Todd put the link in, so again, everybody can see it. But we've we've been through this a number of times, and I think we're sort of at the place where we might as well just approve it and move forward. Yep. Uh, oh, the other change I, pardon me, sorry, the, the other change I made was I, I, I called this guidelines, because again, I know that, you know, we, we currently, you know, I, I don't think the intention would be that we were sort of enforcing any kind of rigid scheme, but this is what we were recommending for people to use, and so I, I also added the, to the title that it's guidelines. Cool. Uh, any, any questions or comments from anyone before we do a quick vote here? So one quick question, this is Arno. Um, how does that uh, compare with the tool that is being under discussion for versioning with Go? It's not so much a tool as much as the way that you do versioning in Go is still rather immature. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're trying to find a way so that when you do a Go get um, to download uh, you know, the package uh, or whether you do a vendor the package that you're getting the appropriate version. Um, and the various schemes that are out there are um, you know, either you have to put uh, a specific version tag uh, on things and you have to, you know, put them actually in physically separate repositories or you have to come up with some scheme that's going to pull a branch and so forth. Um, uh, none of the tools are really very good. So, uh, and the short answer, Arno, is they're really, you know, at the best we can do today, I think will be at the very high level. So the um, sort of the, the, the minor release um, would be the best granularity we could get and then everything else would be the most current of those. Um, and so if you're following the Ember, you know, policy correctly, then there should be no breaking changes when you're doing a minor release and so therefore, um, and certainly there shouldn't be breaking changes when you're doing a, um, uh, you know, a, a bug fix patch and so forth. Uh, so I think that that will work, but again, I think it's going to be, um, uh, I think we'll, we'll learn over time, but I don't think it should change necessarily how we, you know, how we number these things. I mean, in any event, we still want to be sort of telegraphing through the version, whether it's in change or not, and, you know, if it's a, a fixed pack, what version is it? All right, that's good. Thank you. I just want to. Uh, I was wondering if there was some incompatibility you already knew about, <laughs> but it sounds no, like not really. Know. No, it, it it pretty much fits. But like I said, you you cannot. Yeah. I'm not aware of any way that you can get the granularity that we're looking for all the way down to the 
you know, I understand. Level. Thanks. This is Jeremy from an adoption point of view. What if what you did was use the go path to be to pull the latest stable release automatically by default, treat it as a distribution mechanism as opposed to a developer package method? Um, when we get to the point where we have stable ones, that might make sense, Jeremy. I think, um, and in fact, it, it does make sense to have the sort of the, the naked pull work that way. Um, when we're in churn the way we are now, with um, certainly with the fabric, um, uh, it doesn't work that well um, because uh, if you're just doing development and you want to be working on a stable version, that's fine. But if you're um, uh, you know, if you're actually working on the, the, the platform itself and trying to develop it, it makes it a little bit more difficult, right? You have to you have to go through and, and you can't use the typical Go tools. You have to sort of fake it out by cloning the, the repository, checking out a branch and so forth. It's a little bit clunky. All right, so uh, any other questions, or uh, shall we vote at this point? I say go for it. All right, it looks like a plus one from Arnaud. Uh, Chris? Yes. Dan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Hart? Yes. Mick? Yes. Morali? Yes. Richard? Yes. All right. So that passes unanimously. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, next up, very quickly, because we're yep. five minutes. Um, uh, the wiki. What's the plans for the wiki? I think the the check at this point was: were there any showstoppers from the technical community, or any hesitations to migrating over to uh, the DocuWiki at uh, wiki.hyperledger.org? Uh, or if people feel comfortable at this point to move forward with that. In terms of starting to transition, you know, I can help with some of that, and obviously the community will help as well. I think really the only thing holding things up at this point was uh, any hesitations that people had or anything else that they wanted to see get ironed out before we start with the migration. Uh, one question that came up yesterday in the white paper group was just uh, who will be responsible for doing the migration? Um, is your expectation that each of the uh, owners of the documents pick them up and move them over, or is there going to be an automated process? Yeah, I think it's going to be more of a manual process. So I can obviously help with a lot of the TSC-focused stuff, uh, but then the individual work groups uh, and whatnot, uh, the expectation would be that they would uh, migrate their own stuff over. It, so, so and, go ahead, sorry. Some documents have been migrated already, obviously. Who did the job? I don't know. I know that this, this guy, uh, Georg, had done a, a very good job of exploring it and researching it, and he you know, had a number of plug-in recommendations to make things a little bit easier to work with and so forth. But um, I think, for the most part, my understanding is that it should just be able to cut and paste the, the raw, you know, uh, markdown, and 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 you know, and then and any little minor cleanup. So, it, I mean, it's 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 a piece of work, and you know, Todd's obviously going to help us with the TSC section, but um, you know, maybe we could, you know, maybe we can all sort of pitch in. I'm 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 happy to help with a few pages. I don't know. This is uh, Greg. I, my only comment was that, well, first of all, it, I think the lack of a wiki is really hurting us, so I don't want to say anything. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Lay it further. But uh, that said, I remember there was some conversation about uh, options or plugins or whatever that would help with the markdown import. Is that already in place? Because I haven't followed it the last few weeks. Like, do we have the ability to just take the markdown and import it now, or is that something we still have to translate to the, to the DocuWiki format? I'm not sure on that one, Chris. I don't know if you've seen any more, and I haven't heard back from uh, the LFIT yet, so is, I can ping them. Yeah, Gayhurg is on the on the call. I just saw him paste something in. Um, 
uh, where he's done some test migration. I know Georg, I don't know if you're on the voice uh, or not. It'd be you know if you have any input, that'd be great. But I think Todd, you said you were going to check with the team, and, and you said you hadn't heard back with them. Yep. So let me let me send a note right yeah. now. Okay. So I obviously we need to get the plugins. That works for you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Georg. Yeah. Go ahead. So I what I basically did is uh, looked at the moving several pages. It takes a few minutes for each page since we don't have the markdown plugin at the moment. And what I just do is replace the things that you can see on the test migration. And I use some regex um, commands to do that fairly quickly. So I, I don't think it's too much of a hassle. It just is copying manually takes a while. So I guess the, the question is, is the plugin something that we can easily just have someone install or is it a big deal? And that's what Todd was checking with the uh, the team that supports the uh, right. the service. Um, he just hasn't heard back from them. Yeah, if so, I may, it, it is not a big deal. Um, I can't do it, but it should be relative. This should be like a one day thing to knock out. So if that's the case, that would be my preference. But otherwise, I think. Yeah. Uh, Georg's solution is, in the interest of expediting the expediting the process, let's just get something in place. Yeah. So, so Todd, let's see if we can't sort of put a little bit of pressure on the IT team. Yep, I, I just sent a note. And and uh, and get a decision, either one way or the other. And I don't know. I, I guess then the other question was, are we going to reboot and sort of you know clear everything out, or are we going to leave it the way it is and I, my my preference would be let's just leave it. There's no harm in anything that was put out there, I don't believe. And then that way, if people have already started to try and test out a migration of something, that they won't have to do it again. Um, oh, you mean cleaning up the new content? I thought you yeah. were talking about cleaning up the old content. <laughs> Once no, we've no, no, migrated no. everything, do we delete the old stuff? Is my question. Oh no no no! I think the question was that the, uh, the some of the thinking had been that we've left this thing open as a playground to sort of toy around and play with things, and that we would then nuke it and do it again. And I don't see a reason to nuke it, is what I'm saying. Well, In terms of the old stuff, yes, I think we want to actually lock that down, and so that would mean Rye would put the last turn of the screw, and it would probably make the wiki disappear. Sounds good to me. I think that's a good idea because it's not because it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of trash floating around. It looks like people put some yeah. nice stuff in there. That's right. And we can always delete the you know individual things that don't seem appropriate or relevant. Whatever. I would hate losing the the work that Georg has put in. No, I agree. <laughs> I do yes. want to thank. Thank you. Before. Yes, that was a bit of work. We just need to update those pages, and then we should be good to go, migrating all the other pages. So, again, I think for the whole team, Georg, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, you're welcome. Another feature that the Docker Wiki has that we couldn't have with the GitHub Wiki is categories. So when you go to the sitemap page, you see that I created some groups to group the pages under, and maybe we can come up with a way of categorizing our pages and using that when we create new pages to keep the wiki clean. Cool. Excellent. All right, so Todd, why don't you follow up and see if we can't get those plugins okay. plugged. And, uh, and then uh, whether or not, we should probably look at maybe Monday being, let's just sort of start pulling stuff over. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Um, thanks. All right. Next up is um, I'm gonna. Where's my thing? You go. Hold on. Sorry. Um, Vipin, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on next week if you don't mind. I'd like to get to uh, uh, Taki Emerson's uh, proposal for Aroha. No problem. So Todd, let's put that on the agenda for next week. Yep, sounds good. Um, so for Aroha, Hello, are you on?
I see him. I don't yeah, I just uh, changed him to presenter. Makoto, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can All you right, looks like it's working now. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, where should I start? So I explained this uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, I spent actually quite a lot of time, uh, as people had lots of questions. Uh, and I'll bring up the proposal here. Uh, here we go. Can everyone see this? Well, you know, Okay, so I assume everyone has uh, seen uh, the page. So uh, our proposal, in short, is, uh, is a new project for incubation uh, that we're proposing with uh, three different co-sponsors, uh, Hitachi, NTT Data, and uh, Kolu, uh, who are uh, also Hyperledger members. Uh, the basic uh, story is that we want to create a, a set of blockchain C++ components uh, that together can form its own ledger that stands alone, but also these components we want to be callable from projects such as Fabric and Sawtooth Lake. And uh, the main reasoning behind using C++, uh, or one of the main reasons, <coughs> is up until now there hasn't been any development environment uh, for C++ developers to contribute to Hyperledger, and there's quite a lot of C++ developers in the world. Um, so we want to create an environment where people could create C++ components. Uh, also, C++ is a very dynamic language. Uh, C++ 17 is out next year, and uh, it's, uh, it seems to be getting better and better as a language over time. So it's much better than uh, you know 10 years ago. Also, uh, one other uh, feature of our proposal uh, are, uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, three different uh, libraries for interface uh, for mobile and uh, web application development. So uh, until now, Hyperledger, Hyperledger as a project hasn't really had much support for user interfaces or user experience. So we want to make it easy to create uh, native uh, I iOS and Android apps uh, as well as uh, make web apps. So we have a, a Swift iOS library, a Android library and the JavaScript library uh, that are all uh, is part of the uh, submission. So uh, the goal, I'll just uh, briefly showcase one of these. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here's the iOS library. So we have a CocoaPod uh, install file, so you can just install it using pod install. Uh, if you're an iOS developer, you probably have seen this before. And then once you uh, install the library, you can just import it. So for example, import Iroha Swift. Uh, you can create a key pair just like this, and then you can do different things with the keys, get account info, et cetera. Um, so basically, it's really, really easy to, uh, to build uh, applications. So for example, if you're in a hackathon or something, it's very uh, useful to have libraries that can quickly do uh, basic functionality like this. Uh, now, as far as our proposal, uh, so the first version here is uh, made for Idroha, but really, you know, we got lots of feedback at Cybos and in Amsterdam, and we don't want to stop it there. We want to actually uh, make it not a uh, Idroha uh, iOS library, for example, but a Hyperledger iOS library. So, for example, uh, kind of abstract out differences between the different ledgers in the project and just have a basic concept such as uh, creating you know, key pairs and uh, you know, doing membership registration. Uh, as much as possible, just be able to uh, create an abstract interface for people to do. Uh, so it doesn't matter what kind of backend uh, they're dealing with. So that's the, um, <clears throat> that's the end goal or the vision of uh, what we uh, want to do. So uh, the, these are some of the, the basic features. That's kind of like the five minute overview. There's also, uh, let's see. So here's a basic overview here. <clears throat> uh, our crypto is, we want to make it uh, modular, but uh, right now we support uh, Twisted Edwards Curve and uh, SHA-3. And uh, these are all uh, implemented on uh, C++, iOS, Android, and JavaScript. And uh, that was 
quite a tremendous effort to uh, to get these libraries to work or to get the uh, digital signatures to be exactly the same uh, on all these platforms because uh, there's a lot of differences in uh, base64 encoding etc so it's quite a lot of work uh, let's see we also have a new uh, consensus algorithm which is kind of one of the main features I think uh, and I think Later in the meeting, uh, there's going to be some talk about uh, Java-based smart contracts. And uh, so that's kind of what we're doing is with a, a sandboxed uh, JVM. So we should be able to make uh, this interoperable with uh, what Fabric or what uh, Java-based uh, Fabric smart contracts are. Uh, here's the basic architecture here. So we have a peer-to-peer -peer network at the bottom. Uh, things like uh, data validations and basic validation is done in C++. Uh, consensus is in C++. That's in uh, our algorithm, Simiragi. Uh, and uh, for database, we just use level DB, uh, DB um, you know, modular. And then we have uh, sandboxed uh, Java VM. And uh, the API server is going to change, but right now we're using Pro uh, for uh, just REST API. Uh, we want to support uh, gRPC in the future, so we already are looking into that, uh, not just for the API library, but also for the iOS, Android, and JavaScript uh, libraries. So that's uh, something we want to support uh, in the short term, basically to be as compatible as possible with uh, Fabric. Uh, let's see, we're we're working with a few different institutions. So we have the co-sponsors uh, on the proposal, but then we also are uh, doing uh, collaborative research with the University of Aizu in Fukushima uh, Prefecture. Uh, we're working with uh, Koldu uh, in Israel and with uh, Glocom, which is a think tank here in Japan, and uh, with NTT Data, and also uh, Rakuten Securities and uh, Sonpo Japan, which is uh, one of the big three uh, insurance companies here. Uh, we're we're working with them to issue things like uh, uh, securities, uh, or, sorry, insurance contract derivatives on the on the blockchain. Um, so that's kind of the basic overview of the proposal. I don't know how much time I have, uh, so I, I could talk for the next few hours if you want. Um, but uh, uh, I, no one's stopping me, so I'll just keep going. Um, so our uh, consensus algorithm, uh, the basic idea is, uh, sorry, I need to write more uh, documentation, but the basic idea is that for BFT, for different Byzantine fault-tolerant algorithms, there's two different uh, broad categories. There's uh, broadcast-based and there's chain-based. Uh, so broadcast-based are algorithms like uh, BBFT, uh, Sieve, chain-based, uh, there are many algorithms in the literature, uh, the algorithm we based our work mainly on is the one called uh, uh, B-Chain. So it's by uh, C.C. Duan. Uh, and uh, this, this algorithm is uh, it's, it's very <coughs> interesting. So the idea is that uh, instead of broadcasting the transaction to all the peers, for the common case, this, uh, this flowchart shows the uh, common case without a Byzantine failure. Uh, you take the broadcast into the, or take the uh, transaction to the API server, you broadcast it to all the validating peers, uh, and then out of the validating peers, you only need to collect uh, 2F plus 1 uh, signatures. So uh, in this case, if you have four signatures and F is equal to 1, then, uh, then this node uh, here, server three is what's called the proxy tail. So they're the one that uh, that's you know signs the transaction or collects all the signatures and then broadcasts uh, the signature set to everyone, uh, assuming no Byzantine failures. And uh, so here, you instead of having uh, all four servers validate uh, the transaction and sign, you only have server one, two, and three, two F plus one. Validate and sign, server three clicks, and then uh, once it gets two F plus one signatures, it uh, broadcasts to all the nodes, and then you can go back and contact the uh, client uh, if you want. And uh, also, yeah, each uh, peer uh, uh, commits to the transaction after receiving uh, two F plus one uh, signatures uh, from the proxy tail. So 
that's the uh, the basic idea is uh, you go down in this chain to do the transaction signing and then broadcast uh, once you collect all the transactions uh, as opposed to uh, algorithms like PBFT where you do uh, lots of message passing uh, around the network so this is the uh, the first uh, draft of the algorithm and it's it's very similar to uh, the B chain algorithm in the uh, literature uh, yeah that's the the basic uh, story here I'm I've been working on okay so maybe here so I've been working on a uh, specification for v1 uh, which will hopefully show the um, the overall vision that we want to create so I've been writing this the idea is uh, in addition to chain code so we want to practice what's called a domain driven development so uh, we support uh, basic chain code uh, transactions, uh, like a, well, basically a chain code life cycle is what we want to support. So deploy, invoke, update, uh, destroy, and uh, in addition to the chain code flex that gives you lots of flexibility, we must also want to make it really easy to do uh, certain tasks related to use case. For example, creating uh, digital assets and sending these digital assets to other people. So to help facilitate that, facilitate that we, uh, we have different transaction types. Um, a domain is like a domain name type of registration and then assets are associated with the uh, domain name and then can be transferred to others. Uh, arbitrary data can just be stored in blobs. Uh, and then uh, membership service, we want to make it decentralized using uh, just transactions uh, on the ledger for adding and uh, removing peers. This was uh, discussed in Amsterdam at the architecture uh, working group meeting. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, the right way to, to do this uh, type of thing. So, and uh, other things that I want to write. So I'm still working on adding uh, more to this uh, draft. Uh, so at this stage, uh, are there any questions? Hi, this is Greg. I was wondering, so so the basic algorithm that you implemented for consensus, um, you know, I've, I've seen designs like that before, and generally one of the biggest problems with that approach is what happens when you have disagreement, right? So how, how do you reconcile the last stage of commit? So, I mean, I, I understand the point that if someone was going to, say, verify a certain block that contained a certain number of transactions in there, and if everybody submits uh, in the non-Byzantine case, a signature for it, then it all works smoothly. But what happens when uh, you end up having some level of Byzantine uh, type behavior introduced? So, like perhaps some nodes don't even receive some of the signatures, and so on and so forth. Like, how do you? How do you? So here, here's a scenario, right? So say you gather two F plus one signatures on server three, but server four never uh, never receives the threshold, so they don't make, they don't see it as a committed transaction. How do you propose that that would reconcile the state so that everyone knows that a new block was was uh, committed to the ledger? Okay, so uh, all the chain or all the nodes in the network know uh, the order that the uh, uh, the servers should process the transaction, and they know who should uh, who should broadcast. So I didn't really explain uh, all that part, but the uh, the order that the servers are, are uh, process the transaction is based on uh, the the distance between each server's public key and the nodes or the transaction's private, uh, sorry, hash. So that the transaction hash is a numeric value, and each uh, each server in the network has a public key associated with it, which is also a numeric value. So it just takes a, the distance between uh, those those values in order to get uh, <coughs> the uh, the transaction processing order. So all the nodes know uh, who should uh, broadcast at the end. And uh, they also know uh, that they should uh, you expect, once they uh, sign a message and then they give it to uh, that node, they set a timer and then within, let's say, two seconds, if they don't get a response, then they, you know, they know that this server either is faulty or some of the servers are faulty and there weren't enough signatures. So what uh, each server will do is then uh, go and send their transactions to the subsequent nodes. So in this case, uh, server four. So this this uh, you know four node network can only support uh, one 
Byzantine failure. But uh, if you have multiple Byzantine failures and multiple nodes or more nodes, then you just can keep going down the chain until eventually uh, either everyone times out in, and uh, commits a failure or you get uh, enough signatures for the transaction. Yep. So, I, um, popping up from the from the actual algorithm itself, what? So, um, one of the things um, in in reading the proposal, I was having a hard time figuring out is exactly what this is. Is it a library um, that could be incorporated? Is it a standalone ledger? Um, and just just a, a concrete version of that question. Um, so, I'm assuming that if I use your uh, consensus algorithm, if I want to pull that in then I would also have to pull in all of the peer-to-peer -peer communication code, especially given what you just said about uh, expectations for server ordering and um, uh, membership. So how modular is it really? Is this something that I can actually pull pieces in independently, or do I have to take the big chunk to use Okay, it? that's a great question. So uh, to answer the first question, uh, this is an independent standalone ledger, uh, but you know, we don't want to just, uh, I don't know, lead to fragmentation of the project, but we also want to create an additive, uh, you know, we want to make everything componentized so that it's additive to the other projects as well. Uh, I think uh, the vision that we're moving towards or that we want to help promote is uh, maybe not this early stage, but in two or three years, I, I see Hyperledger maybe is having low you know, not, not many different projects, but rather more of a uh, standard protocol and then different components that uh, implement different aspects of this protocol. So that's kind of what we want to move towards. To answer your second question uh, about the modularization or the ability to take out different pieces, the consensus is done uh, on what are called consensus events, which we, which they're just abstractions. It doesn't matter uh, what, uh, people are trying to get consensus on. Uh, now, for there has to be some kind of uh, abstraction for you know peer communication, and the details of that don't have to be done. Uh, you know, using so we're using Aaron, which is a, a messaging queue, but uh, you don't you don't have to use Aaron. You can use any kind of uh, protocol for uh, messaging, and uh, so basically we just have. Uh, or uh, functions to contact uh, like different nodes on the network just uh, assuming or the way we do it is we get a list of these nodes from the membership service. So all the validating peers have to be known but that's the only uh, limitation really. But I think uh, any kind of typical BFT, well okay there's, there's a few uh, cases where you don't have to know all the peers, but uh, for most algorithms, uh, you do have to know uh, all the peers that you're working with. So it does, I mean, it, it sounds to me like there's quite a few interdependencies between the modules, at least in the current um, implementation and expectation. Um, That's but that correct. They might, uh, yeah, okay. Um, one more quick question on that. Um, what is your... What's the maturity level of the code? Is this something where you're deploying POCs right now, or is this still? I mean, that the architecture diagrams that I saw in the code look um, preliminary. Um, is, yeah, so is, is the code advanced beyond the the documents, or what's the current status? Okay, so the code currently uh, just uses uh, Aaron as a peer-to-peer -peer messaging queue. Um, we do have a basic implementation of. Uh, uh, the consensus algorithm, but that's still being uh, changed to uh, to add you know different validation checks for uh, state global state using Merkle truth. So once that's uh, done, I think uh, we ha are in a pretty good shape for a basic uh, version that uh, can be used for things like POCs. We are using a limited subset of this uh, for some POCs at the moment, uh, but uh, I mean yeah, this is a work in pro progress. But uh, I think the reason for uh, proposing this into incubation at this stage is to help guide the overall architecture and the design uh, rather than us doing everything on our own and then later uh, saying, hey, here, look what we built. Thank you. So 
Yeah, go ahead. One question I have, sorry, is um, you, you mentioned at the beginning that some of the motivation came from um, your desire to include the C++ community in in the and you know in specific clients like mobile uh, at, to participate on the hyperledger project but I'm just curious uh, you know what what motivated you to go in this direction like say like did you feel as though you couldn't um, you couldn't implement say an iOS client or a C++ contract in the existing frameworks like was there a specific reason why you had to go in this direction or is there uh, you know what's what's your thoughts there Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so we've kind of felt that uh, within the current framework, it's hard to, uh, you know, well, the API changes a lot, for one thing. Uh, and uh, lots of things are still changing, including the change switch to GP gRPC. So we kind of uh, want to kind of create our own uh, platform that we could, uh, you know, have more control to kind of uh, try different things and uh, kind of ex experiment. We also want to make something a little bit lighter uh, wait. So instead of using something like Docker, uh, we use just a kind of sandbox JVM. So um, that's the basic motivation. Uh, another thing is uh, we start uh, working on this around uh, well around March, I guess, and or that's when we start proposing it. And uh, at that time, uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of difficulties with uh, doing it on current projects. But uh, at this uh, point in time, uh, it's, I think it makes sense to have kind of a smaller project with a, uh, I don't know, code base in a different language that can, uh, you know, slowly adapt to a more standardized protocol. So, I, you know, I haven't had a chance to fully digest this, so I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. But one, com one thought I had just based on the current discussion is that, um, you know, if you're worried about, uh, churn, I mean, this is only going to add more churn, right? There'd be more diversity or more, more choices and, and more fragmentation just naturally from having another choice. Um, and the other comment I would have is that, you know, I, I don't know as much about Sawtooth Lake, but on the Fabric side, I know, you know, there's nothing that precludes C++ chain code or non-Docker-based containerization or any, any of those kind of things. So you don't necessarily have to not use the framework for those reasons. Um, that being said, it I, you know it is a fair point. I understand things are are turning a lot, and 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 that's something we need to to converge on stabilizing as we move forward. Yeah, uh, regards to fragmentation, uh, I think uh, fragmentation in the long term is uh, is a really bad thing, but I think at the beginning at the stage, uh, this is kind of a uh, time in the project uh, you know still trying out new things, and the direction isn't completely decided yet. I think there's a lot of uh, value in trying uh, lots of different things and then, uh, you know, taking the best of the different uh, ideas that are put forth. I'm going to... Yeah, I would agree with that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. This, this is Todd. I'm just going to jump in quickly here. Uh, I know we're about 10 minutes over. Uh, I think two of the TSC members have dropped, and it looks like Dan is needing to drop now as well, so we're well under quorum at this point. Um, given that, and given that this is an important topic... Um, my recommendation would be that uh, we move some of this discussion to the mailing list, a lot of these questions, uh, to work through this over the coming week, uh, and then revisit this topic uh, in next week's TSC meeting, um, as it seems like there's still some questions uh, that people want to um, kind of kick the tires and get answered. Um, th does that work for, for those still on the call? Yep. Yes, and can I recommend that we move? this discussion yeah, to the beginning good. of the call rather than the end. Yeah, definitely. And I think things um, got kicked off a little slower today than, than we would have hoped. So um, agree. Uh, we'll get this up front. Um, and then the only other things, work group updates, if everyone can just send that over uh, via email just as a response to the uh, minutes that will go out. And then the last question, uh, Satish, are you still on? Uh, my one question is, do you prefer for me to send a video of your demo out, or do you want to get slotted in for next week to walk through uh, your Java chain code demo? Um, OK, about the video, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, looks like it. About the video, I will I will email you again if you're good to go ahead with the video. But um, yeah, I would prefer to do a demo so that I can take questions and then answer them. You know. So yeah. Okay, sounds good.
Um, and then before we wrap up, uh, any any questions from anyone else? I know Chris has had to drop as well. Todd, I think, I, I think decision was wise with regard to the decision on the project here. I just wanted to share with those who weren't at the meeting last week that uh, we actually had a discussion in relation to this which was about should we have some form of criteria to decide what qualifies as an incubation. We've talked about incubation exit criteria and there was this question, well should you be some kind of entry criteria in a way and I mean to be <laughs> to be fair I don't think we really got anywhere with the discussion but I still think you know this was an interesting discussion that people should be aware yeah the I mean I think uh, there is the entry criteria which is uh, basically a sound proposal that makes sense uh, uh, to the TSC members but the problem is that we are getting loaded up with so much uh, stuff that you know like right in the beginning we talked about 40 minutes about uh, wiki and this and that so I think uh, there might be a, 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 a problem if <coughs> the TSC members cannot really engage and uh, you know because it, it really demands high level of uh, attention if you're going to vote on this kind of stuff. Uh, this is, you know, and the landscape is moving so fast. Like next week, for example, you guys have moved this Irohi thing to next week, plus you're going to have uh, the demo, the Java demo. Uh, you know, it's basically trying to fit a lot of stuff into a small uh, you know, one and a half hours. It's possible. But yep. Yeah, agree, Vipin. All good points, and I think uh, Mick had a good point as well with moving this up to the front. So for for next TSC, we'll keep the um, kind of updates and administrative stuff uh, to uh, you know a minimum, uh, and really move on this more more critical stuff uh, up front. Okay, sounds good. All right, uh, any other questions or comments before we wrap up? All right, uh, sounds good. Thank you everyone for your time. Uh, minutes will go out uh, later this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Todd. Thank, Thank you. you.